Deputy oh, Mayor, sorry. can I just uh, can I just make sure that we have the recording underway? I I don't yep, have the ability it, to yeah, record. It says, so. Yep, it says recording and transcription. Thank you. It is recording. Okay. Yeah, Andrew, you may want to just repeat that for the those listeners. I think we may have just uh, we may have just missed the first bit, so that people know where where they can find sure. the recording. Yep. So uh, so this meeting is being recorded, and it'll be posted on the uh, local governance reform page on uh, sackville.com's uh, website. So if you go to the main sackville.com and uh, scroll down, there's a local governance section in there, and you'll see the recording on there um, possibly tomorrow. I'm not sure when it'll get posted, but after this meeting. Uh, so I'll call the meeting to order. Um, do I have anybody to... Uh, I guess I'm unfamiliar with the committee of council, so I'm not sure if we have to have a mover and a seconder for for the for the meeting, or do we just call it to order? Call it to order. Okay. So I'll call the meeting to order. Um, before we begin, I'll just read off a, a land acknowledgement. I would like to begin by acknowledging that the land on which we gather is the traditional unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq peoples. This territory is covered by the treaties of peace and friendship which Mi'kmaq peoples first signed with the British Crown in 1725. The treaties did not deal with surrender of lands and resources, but in fact recognized Mi'kmaq title and established the rules for what was to be an ongoing relationship between nations. We, the members of this committee of council and town staff assisting us this evening, pay respect to the elders past and present and descendants of this land. We honor the knowledge keepers and seek their guidance as we strive to develop closer relationships with the indigenous people in New Brunswick. Um, so I guess I don't have to have an approval of the agenda. We'll just move on. Um, just before we begin, just to set some rules, if you, if everybody on the call could keep their microphones muted as much as possible, that would be great. And put your hand up to speak. That would also be great. I'll try to keep track of who puts their hand up first, just to make it fair. Um, and the agenda is reasonably light uh, in the number of topics on it, uh, but there's a lot to talk about. So. First on the agenda, I'll just give an update on the reform history. Um, we we can have some comments afterwards if people want to make comments. I would I'd like it if prep, if possible to not focus too much on the reform history. This is stuff we've all been through already. If you want to make some comments, that would be great. Um, because the next the next items on the agenda is our current situation and then next steps. So there's probably going to be more in there to to talk about. And since we have about an hour, I think six to seven o'clock is what we've scheduled for this meeting, it would be nice to be able to move it along as quickly as possible. Um, also, I did have the on the agenda a UMNB update. Um, I'm not going to have anything to report on that. I was hoping to hear from uh, Dan um, Murphy, the executive director, and Alex Schulten, the president, just to see if they had any comments. Um, but they they didn't have anything to report as they're going to be meeting with some representatives from the minister's department next week. So there may be something coming down the pipe later on. Um, all right, so reform history. I, I made some notes. So if I'm not staring directly at the camera. Oh, sorry, Sean, your hands up. Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I'm just wondering if it might be good to uh, provide to uh, the public uh, the purpose of this committee. Um, there was no terms of reference uh, put in place um, and when this committee was struck. And I, I just think it would be important to advise the public the purpose of this committee and and what uh, what it will be doing. Um, Bill, did you want to say something? Uh, I, I don't mind speaking to this, but if you had a comment, you can go ahead. Yes, thank you. Um, I would like to respond because I was one of the people who pushed for the formation of this committee. And the committee was formed in my recollection for my intention was because there was a lack of action in response to the announcement of the white paper. And so this is this committee was formed by councillors who were concerned with the lack of um, an appropriate response. The, the, the council had indicated that it was against forced amalgamation and the response from the mayor originally was uh, rather accepting and passive. And in fact, in the interview that he did on CHMA about it, instead of protesting, he said he'd be interested in running for re-election. So this committee 
is uh, is our opportunity to inform the public about what's being forced on us. It's not a vehicle for the Conservatives to push their agenda. They, they can do that through their advisory committees. This is our committee to inform the public about what's being forced on us. That's the history. Um, yeah, it, it, it is a an opportunity to tell the public about about uh, ongoing issues, concerns and information that come out from municipal reform. Absolutely. Um, Sabine, did you have a comment? Yeah, and I'm going to be a bit slow. Um, so there were draft terms of reference. I think that's probably when if we if we maintain this this committee, we have to um, develop them and approve them. Um, or ask for council to approve and bring them forward to council. So there is a draft committee terms of reference that I think I circulated way back when we when we were discussing this. Um, and I'll just read the mandate that was in the is in the draft, but that also formed the reason for the mo motion to council to provide a venue for information exchange discussions, presentations, gathering information and discussions on the implementation of the white paper through the transition process as long as required as long as risk required provide information, reports, and recommendations to council on municipal reform issues. So obviously the first point is mute, since the white paper is what it is and it's been implemented. So that remain the, what remains is provide information, reports, and recommendations to council on municipal reform issues. That is still in the uh, in the draft terms of reference. So, but it's it's to provide a venue for information exchange. Thank you, Andrew. Thanks for that, Sabine. Thank, thank you very much, Sabine. Um, okay, so uh, I'm going to give a, a I want to say brief rundown. Um, I did write some notes. Uh, I'll I talk fairly quickly, uh, so I, I hope I get through to everybody. Um, and I'm going to be reading from something, so I apologize if I'm not looking at the screen uh, all the time. But uh, so the province of New Brunswick started the process to modernize NB's local governance system in November of 2020. After appointing Daniel Alain, the Minister of Local Government and Local Governance Reform in September of 2020. The Green Paper on Municipal Reform was released in April 2021 and laid the groundwork uh, based on what the minister heard speaking with communities while crisscrossing the province in his early days as a minister. Um, this launched the engagement process by the Department of Local Government and Local Governance Reform. The town issued a letter to the minister with initial thoughts and possible concerns around the green paper. Um, one point in particular, which was focused on at that time was that, that the town of Sackville was not for amalgamation. Various engagement sessions happened between April and the release of the white paper in November of 2021, including meetings with municipalities, cities, LSDs, municipal associations, uh, the AMANB, which is the administrators of New Brunswick, public sessions, and uh, also with other stakeholders. They also had an online survey for New Brunswickers to complete. And during that time, the minister and his department answered questions and updated their website as the process rolled on, focusing on the green paper contents and began preparations for another report that came out, which was the What We Heard document. And that came out in September of 2021. The municipal reform white paper was released in November of 2021 which according to the provincial government took into consideration the input from all the engagement sessions, the survey, the what we heard report, current structure, as well as local government reports from the last few decades, such as the Finn report in 2008, uh, two local governance reform reports from the Assemblée Nationale de l'Acadie and the Francophone Association of Municipalities in New Brunswick, as well as several others. The white paper can easily be described using quotes from some of the other documents the minister and his department have released. From the green paper, quote, changing the existing local governance structure to adapt it to current needs will be complex and the exact nature of the changes have not yet been defined, end quote. From the what we heard report, quote, local governance reform requires progressive change. The status quo is no longer an option. And finally, from the white paper itself, quote, although our plan is contained in the pages that follow, there is much work ahead to implement the numerous actions. Most, if not all, communities were shocked and shaken by the white paper, particularly around boundaries and amalgamation and what this meant for various facets of municipal governance 
and operations. Sackville Town Council and staff met within a week of the release and had a blue sky discussion about initial thoughts on the white paper and what it could, would mean for the town of Sackville. From this meeting, a letter was drafted and sent to the minister's office with concerns around the four pillars of the white paper. Two weeks after that meeting, council and staff had a meeting with the deputy minister and his department to ask questions and voice concerns, as well as a brief exchange with the minister during the UMNB Zone 2 meeting a few days later. Later that month, council and staff met one more time to go over a letter that would be sent to the minister with an ask for an alternative to amalgamation. That request was refused. Bill 82, an act respecting local governance reform was passed by royal assent in the Legislative Assembly on December 17th, 2021. Earlier in the week at our regular council meeting on December 13th, this Municipal Reform Committee of Council was created, and that is what brings us together tonight. So I may have met, left out some minor details, a few meetings in there, um, maybe some Zoom meetings, but I think I've pretty much covered everything. Um, we, of course, there were emails back and forth as well from the from the minister and the minister's department if there was, you know, an engagement session or whatever. But um, I think I've covered pretty much everything in there. Um, so, I, I, if anybody wants to speak about the history of the reform process, um, uh, go ahead. But if if it's all right, I wouldn't mind just sharing just some just quick initial thoughts on the reform history process. Um, for my part, the whole process that has, has led us to this point has been a roller coaster. I have had to sit through everything that I laid out tonight concerning council and staff, as well as the reform process through my roles and responsibilities uh, with UMNB. To be brief, I have been, for the most part, frustrated with the whole process and the lack of communication that has disguised itself as fulsome communication. I was disappointed at the public engagement piece, particularly around LSDs and the lack thereof, and disheartened by the consistent answer to questions being, the transition team will deal with that. But council and staff have worked hard to get our say in whenever and wherever the opportunity presented itself and tried to do the very best we could for the town we represent. We pushed, we nudged, we kicked and screamed, and even though we were often turned away or turned down, our voices were heard. And just as a quick aside, even if we didn't get the answers we wanted from the minister and his department, we did get answers. So I will at least say that. This reform process is going to continue to roll on with the timelines presented by the government. And as it does, concerns will come up, particulars will be debated. And through all of that, I have great confidence that we will be heard again and again and again. We may not get the answers that we want uh, when we voice our opinions, but I, I do have confidence in the fact that we will be heard. So those are my initial thoughts on, on the history of the reform. Um, if anybody else wants to ask some questions or if any councillors um, or the mayor want to say anything about that, then by all means, please raise your hand. Uh, I think I saw Sabine first. Go ahead. Yeah, I think I think Andrew that um, comprises sort of a friendly a friendly recap of what happened. Um, I think um, you know for anybody who wants to go back into council meetings that we felt that are public, I think there were some more stronger words on this, but that's fine. Um, I think we are. I agree with you. We are where we're at. Um, but I just would like to add that um, anybody who's in the public should really look at the Act itself, Act eighty two as well as the white paper, because it, it it does form what's coming next. So so the current situation and whatever Andrew is going to start us out on. Um, and I think the inherent piece that I wanted to share is the is the other um, exasperation with um, a very undemocratic process, um, which we will likely see going on through our transition period. Um, so I agree, Andrew. Um, I think we've been heard and we will be continue to be heard but that doesn't mean we will be heard or there will be any follow up from it. So I think there's a huge, huge difference between the two. I think I agree with you. I think Fredericton heard us screaming and kicking, um, but um, there was no impact from that. And the same thing when we will get into the current situation, I think there will be a fallout from that. So 
um, to me, this is it, it is what it is. Literally, we will have to deal with it. But um, uh, you know, the, the the last two months, I think what Andrew described as a roller coaster is literally what this was. I think for everybody, for everybody involved in any way. Um, and I'd also like to start talking about actually what's currently going on, what our role is or isn't, and where are the little pieces and itty bitty pieces that we can actually influence. And also make it very clear where we have no no influence at all. So, my two cents. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Sabine, and that and that is coming up. So when we get it to our current situation, we'll we'll talk about about some of that stuff as well. Um, Bill, you had your hand up. Go ahead. Yeah, um, I I think we're all struggling with uh, what we should do, what we can do, what's the right thing to do. The easy thing to do is to give up, and I'm not prepared to do that. And in fact, I'm troubled because the way I see it, a number of people um, have given up. And I say, yes, it looks bleak, but what's the downside to resisting uh, and, and trying to inform people? Because the vast majority of people in Sackville, I don't think are even aware that this is going on and what the consequences might be. Uh, the pandemic and the hospital threats are much more important and more well known to more people. And I think we have a lot of work to do to galvanize people to this issue because it's going to have huge consequences. Um, I'm really troubled because this is not like a, a decision like we, I want to do this and you want to do that. And so we make a decision and one of us doesn't get what we want and we move on. Absolutely. This is about right and wrong. This wasn't just a decision that we didn't like. This was dishonest. We were lied to by the minister repeatedly. So the whole process was flawed. It was undemocratic. And the ironic thing is the big issue, one of the big issues that needs to be addressed is what we might call the democratic deficit. The fact that people in unincorporated areas can't vote at the local level. The solution, and I put air quotes around this, the solution is to deny the people in Sackville and Dorchester their say in local affairs. It's being forced on us. So to solve one democratic deficit, they're imposing another. It's, it's ridiculous. As somebody once said in a different context, it's worse than wrong. It's stupid because they're not, in fact, solving the problem. And it's really sleazy because the other big issue that has to be addressed is the fact that people in unincorporated areas don't pay their fair share of taxes. And so who's going to increase the taxes on these people in the future? It's going to be this new municipality. So the provincial government that has to deal with this, it's their job. They're foisting this off on the municipality. Our staff are going to have to make this work. And we're going to have to, or the new community is going to have to raise the taxes on these people and suffer that. So it's it's dishonest, it's undemocratic, it's counterproductive, and it's sleazy. And I say, why quit? Why go passively uh, into the night, even though they've made this decision? And there's so many war and sports analogies. But the difference in a war and in a football game, for example, is there's a real price to be paid to continue. People die, people get hurt. There's no price to pay here to keep speaking truth to power. This process isn't over. It's hardly begun. So if the score is against you, it's discouraging, but I don't think you give up and you certainly don't start playing for the other side. So unless you're trying to curry favor with the conservatives, I think when you find yourself in a situation like this where you're relatively powerless, you speak up and you call them out for what they've done and what they're doing. And you inform people about the likely consequences and you rally support. What you don't do is provide cover for the people who are assaulting our rights and you certainly don't actively assist them. So that's my stump speech on this issue. Thank you for the time. Thanks, Bill. Um, Wayne Feindel, you had your hand up. You're on mute. Wayne, you're on mute. You'll have to uh, unmute. Is that better? It is. <laughs> this is new to me. I, I'm from the silent movie era. I'm the old gray mayor of Dorchester. Uh, in a small community, we have uh, the different parties there, the green uh, the conservatives and, and, the, and the liberals. But I've been fortunate enough to be involved with this for 35 years. 
uh, founding father of the Tanamar Planning Commission, blah, 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 and all that stuff. I, but the big thing here is uh, uh, blaming one party over another is not, this goes back a long, long time. Uh, I've been in there when the Liberals try to sneak the reform in under the John Carver model, you know, we've changed the definitions, we tweaked it. And uh, so uh, the real thing is what positive steps can we do? Uh, I have gifts for you as you go along when you want to ask me things because of all those years. Uh, I've fumbled along now in my dotage, but uh, but I can help out. But uh, it's a bill that was just talking. He's he's absolutely right. We've got a problem is that all democracy and all politics is local. The communities were formed by the local people. So were our school boards then when I came here. When we couldn't do something for ourselves, we went to the province or the federal government because with their resources, they can do things better than we can do. But that hasn't happened in this province. Uh, if any of you were at the Mount Allison uh, talk up by uh, Donald Bowser, the anti-corruption expert from the United Nations, I was shocked to hear him say that New Brunswick was the most corrupt state or province in uh, North America. Uh, kind of wakes you up when you do that. Uh, you, we will have to come up with some different plans and strategies, and I'm talking about strategies that don't cost the uh, harm or injury. Uh, Dorchester is a tri-community. We have the federal institution there. I don't know if you've been informed by anybody, but we have an issue with the lieu of taxes. Everybody thinks the pen gives us lots of money. It doesn't. It's been a struggle with, for me, meeting with Minister Alfonso. Oh, my Italian is not very good. Back in the 90s, that said Dorchester Penn should be paying directly for the fire department, for the training, for the equipment, the water, and the police. We are the only community, and you'll be part of that if it goes ahead, that subsidizes the federal government, and it drives me crazy. And the lieu of taxes, the province controls it, and they give it to Moncton. This new community needs that money. And you don't get your real share of the property taxes on this $200 million project. They'll kind of suggest to you that that's going to help. But it's not like the taxes if you were in Sackville or, or Dorchester. So that's one issue that I hope somebody can do some research and dig up. Uh, for me, that goes back to 98 and trying to make a difference. I got a backhanded comment from the uh, the prison when I took over water and sewage again. I'm the only counselor that kept hassling them. So I'll leave it at that. And uh, the things I had to say are gifts, and you could choose what you like or don't like. Uh, I'm a guy that thinks the, the past is, is the key to the future, and you fellows are all young people, so I'm not sure. Thanks. Thanks, Wayne. Um, I, I guess uh, I probably I, I should have said something at the beginning of the meeting. This meeting is is a, a meeting of committee of council, so uh, oh. that was that that was my mistake to invite Wayne to speak. But I guess um, if anybody was going to a longstanding uh, municipal governor like yourself would probably have some insight. So thank you for that, Wayne. Uh, I also know what you just said. Sorry. <laughs> going forward, um, uh, we'll just if this is a committee of council, so if any council members, uh, town staff um the mayor want to to say anything then by all means put your hands up but thank you wayne for that uh sabine you had your hand up did you want to say something no or, i just i just was going to raise that point I of got order away from my chin. <laughs> yeah. so maybe maybe on the agenda um you know if there are questions there could be an opportunity at the end if there's any time but but not during uh, not during our meeting yes Perfect. apologize for that i should know better but i'm a senior that that's fair. And Wayne, can you can you mute your uh, your mic again if you don't mind? Thanks. Yes, I know where it is now. Okay. 
Um, okay, one last uh, call. Did, did anybody want to say anything about the like sort of the reform process up to this point? Let's say till the end of December 31st. Does anybody have anything that they want to say about that? Or can we move on? No? I don't see any hands. Just give me a sec. We have a long scrolling list here. Okay. Um, all right. So next on the agenda is just an, uh, I'll do an update for me. And this is where we can kind of get into the particulars of where we currently stand with the uh, municipal reform process or local governance reform process. Um, so January 18th, we received word from the deputy minister that we now had a transition facilitator. Uh, for the record, this is what the letter, some of the letters said to describe this position. Um, the transition facilitator's primary purpose is to work alongside new local governments and RSCs in their transition phase. To achieve this, they will need to inspire and motivate change as well as lead tactical initiatives such as familiarizing their teams and others with new enabling legislation, developing options and best practices for new council and setting boundaries, presenting options and best practices to support establishment of tax rates in local governments, supporting local governments in preparing for municipal elections, leading the staff of local governments and RSCs executive positions, preparing preliminary budgets, and working with community representatives to determine the new legal name and type of local government. Um, as a letter, uh, and, and, and the letter states that our transition facilitator is Mr. Chad Peters. Um, so he will support and implement the reform process for RSC 8 and entities 33, 39, 40, 42, and 43, which are Salisbury, Port Elegant, Sackville, Alma, and Petticodiac, respectively. So he will be the transition facilitator, not just for us, but for all of those. Um, entities that I have named. On January 26, council and staff had a virtual meeting with Mr. Peters, who went over an introductory presentation on the immediate reform process and also answered the many questions thrown his way. After introductions, Mr. Peters got right into it, first reiterating what areas are going to be amalgamated uh, with Sackville and for the record, just for people who are listening who may not know, uh, that includes Sackville, Dorchester, 40% of Dorchester LSD, Sackville LSD, and Point de Butte LSD. He then talked about the preliminary transition plan and milestones. Uh, so there's, there's a, a fair bit to talk about here. Um, initially, one of the first things that has to be done is the creation of two advisory committees. There will be an elected officials committee, uh, which is comprised which is comprised of two representatives from each of the communities. Now, I guess the communities would be the ones I listed: Sackville, Dorchester, uh, Dorchester LSD, Sackville LSD, and Point of View. Um, the Sackville representatives are the mayor and deputy mayor. Um, I have not heard at this point who is on from the other um, locations. And I think that they're having a little bit of trouble getting the last members needed on the advisory committee. At the same time, there will also be an administrative committee set up, uh, which will be the transition lead as well as administrators. Now, from what I understand, that's administrators from Sackville and Dorchester. Um, the LSDs don't really have administrators, so um, there may be room for somebody from the province possibly to step into that position to comprise that committee. They will be focused on, oh, sorry, let, let's start over. The elected officials committee will be uh, an advisory committee to the transition lead, Chad Peters, and their primary objectives is to uh, review the outer entity boundary for errors or emissions of the entity 40, determine the name of the municipality and the type of the municipality, and determine the council composition and structure. Those are immediate things that have to be completed uh, from what we've heard by the end of February. Um, some of them actually even earlier than that. Um, the administrative committee will basically be in, in charge of everything else. So, um, <laughs> 
everything from uh, operation, anything operational that you that that the town currently does, and that the new entity forty will do, is going to be taken care of by this advisory committee, this administrative advisory committee, and the transition lead. Um, so that's a, a heck of a lot of work for town staff, uh, as well as doing all of the work that is currently involved with running uh, their respective communities, like Dorchester and Sackville, for example. Um, there, uh, in the near, well, I guess not near future, but halfway through the year, there's going to be a staffing plan. Um, and then towards the end of the year, there will be a call out for CAO and clerk positions within the entities. Um, then, uh, Closer, I believe, to the end of September, October, there'll be a 2023 budget that will be presented. Uh, and then municipal elections will happen in November of 2022. And then the new entity will be established in January 1st of 2023. Now, that's a lot of, of material. That's, there's a lot of steps and, a, and there's a good chunk of that that's later in the year. So things will happen. I'm sure that there's going to be dates that will change. Um, along the way, the government has been pretty uh, strict on timelines, but really what we need to focus on is the is the stuff that's happening in February with the advisory committee and the and um, and the formation of council, the name of the town. That's the immediate steps that are uh, that are happening with us right now. Um, sorry, I, I see some hands up. Do you guys want to do you want to talk about this now and then I can continue on? Yeah. Uh, I can't remember who had their hand up first. I saw Sabine and Bill, and I think Bruce, you might have had your hand up too, but you put it down. Um, Bill, go ahead. Yeah, I just wanted to raise a point uh, about the democratic deficit. Is it during our meeting with Chad Peters, I mentioned the fact that Sackville makes up more than half the population of the new entity, and yet it was going to have the same number of representatives as, you know, even the, the LSDs. And so I suggested that Sackville should have more. And his solution was to give us two and everybody else two. So what we end up with is 20% of the representation of this advisory committee, even though we make up more than 50% of the population. Just another example of how they don't understand representation by population. It's infuriating. Uh, Sabine, did you want to? Yeah, I just wanted to, so um, the, because you mentioned the advisory committee, so um, I think I think it's just good to reiterate the importance of the administrative committee that will really get all the work done. We have nothing to do with that as councillors, as elected officials. Um, when, you know, Andrew mentioned staffing plan, if it does come to the HR committee at all, it's all behind closed doors. So it's, it's a black box. Um, I just want to make sure that everybody's very clear on that. And the piece on the advisory committee, which is of elected and appointed officials, um, that is sort of while, you know, while I agree with Bill, it's it's a typical kind of behavior of or a typical non-understanding of democracy or representation. Um, the reality is that um, it's a little bit of misnomer to call it an advisory committee or to say that it will determine, because the reality is the only thing it will ever do is advise. Um, and if and that's why I mentioned Bill 82 earlier, just to be very clear, the the transition lead, what I call the government representative, because this is not a personal thing. This is the government representative has the absolute power. The advisory committee can up, can come up with a weird name for Sackville, for sorry, for entity 40, um, can come up with a really, really interesting approach to council composition. Doesn't matter. It literally will not matter. We were told um, that this will be a consensus approach, but in my experience, engagement and consensus means something very different. So I just want to be very clear that our participation as counselors is very limited and our influence is extremely limited, um, as is um, from what we found out, because apparently we have to determine or we have to determine in quotation marks we have to advise on council composition by February 11th, which is um, 10, 10 days. Um, sorry, probably get it. Yep, something like that. So in 10 days, a major decision how this com community will be, co be composed, you know, how many councillors there will be, how many from each area, 
um, will it be at large or will it be um, by wards? All that, we have 10 days to give any kind of input. And then on top of that, our understanding was that there was some intent to engage the community, but that seems to have fallen by the wayside. And so um, just to make clear that the role of those two committees are first very different. Um, and the advisory committee seemed to have been to me sort of an afterthought and give, in order to give the semblance of some sort of input from the community. Now, I'm still hoping that there will be input possible, um, but we have to be very realistic that the end result is not ours. It's not our decision. It isn't. Just, and, and uh, you know, I have told council before that I don't want to own this. This is, this is if, if I would be in charge of a political community engagement process to figure out the ward system or a large system, that would be different. So just sort of calling it advisory committee and what, how it's made up of, it's just to clarity a bit around the real role of the, of especially the advisory committee and our role as councillors in the whole process. Thanks, Andrew. Thanks, Sabine. Um, I just wanted to say really quickly, uh, Mayor Michaud had to leave. He has a public securities committee meeting um, focusing on policing in the province, so he had, which started at 6.30, so he had to leave early, just let everybody know. Um, I know there, I mean, there's a possibility that we'll get, a, you know, a slightly further away date to be able to uh, poll council on, on what they think the council makeup should look like. But uh, with the tight timelines and with the, uh, the hesitancy of the minister's department to move those timelines, I don't think that will happen. Um, and not to, to reiterate, Sabine, you're right. Um, a lot, the, the bulk of this municipal reform is going to be on the shoulders of staff. Um, it's all operational. It really is. Every bit of it is operational. Um, council will be, uh, uh, will be asked for possible guidance or support of staff. Um, maybe along the way, or if there was a decision that needed to be passed by council, this current council, maybe that will happen. But really, the, the majority of this work is going to be on the shoulders of town staff. We will hear about it, I'm sure, at council meetings. Um, we'll get some update by staff along the way. But really, the, the council, what the council has control over is just as Sabine said, very little. So we will advise as much as possible the transition facilitator who then passes on that information to a regional lead, who then passes that on to the uh, local governance reform directors, who then passes it on to the assistant deputy minister, deputy minister, minister. So the minister is ultimately accountable for all of this. Um, but <laughs> the decisions that council has are, are very limited. And that's a reality I think that we all have to accept. Um, anyway, uh, Bruce, you had your hand up, uh, back up again. Do, uh, do you want to say something? Yeah. Uh, Andrew, I was going to ask you, I know that actually Sackville's being represented, represented by both the mayor, yourself, and yourself. So we do not know who else is represent, being represented. I mean, in Dorchester, wouldn't it be the mayor and the deputy mayor? I, 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 I'm only, yeah, I'm only assuming that because okay. from what I, from what I've, I've read in a letter, I think one of the letters we got from the, the deputy minister's office, I think that they had said that, that it would be a mayor and deputy mayor. So yeah. if it was a community that had a council, then, then yes, it would be that. So okay. I'm assuming that, that that's, that, that it is the mayor and the deputy mayor, unless they choose someone else to sit in that, in that position, which I'm sure they could do. Um, but I haven't I haven't heard 100 percent who's on the advisory committee and I probably won't until our meeting on uh, Tuesday next week. OK, uh, I did hear from somebody who lives in Point of Butte that they do have um, a collection of people who get together to discuss what's going on. So I'm assuming yeah. there'll be people from there. Uh, but as far as the other ones, I, I have no idea who's who. I just thought I'd let you know about that. That's all. 
Yep. Yeah. I've, I've, I've kind of heard through the woodwork too, that point of view has, is fairly um, active as far as looking at, uh, well, not decisions that they can make, but being active in, in, um, in concerns that they have as a community. And so, yeah, you're right. They'll, they'll probably pull from one of those community uh, uh, groups. It's, it's like a volunteer committee, as a matter of fact, if I'm not mistaken. Yep. Uh, Bill, go ahead. Yes, thanks. I just wanted to follow up on what Sabina said. She's absolutely right. These advisory committees are just window dressing. They're cover for what is being forced on us. Staff are the ones who are going to have to do the work. And so they've been given an impossible task impossible to do it that's going to please people and they're going to they're going to wear this like we, they don't own it but they're being told do it they're professionals they're going to do as good a job as they can but if you ask someone to do the impossible they can't succeed so it's going to be less than perfect and people the government will you know provincial government will point to them and say they did it i have become convinced my first impression of the minister he's a get her done kind of guy he wants to be able to say that he did local governance reform and i don't think it matters to him that it's done well so he's going to say it's done and if we're all worse off, you know, the people in the LSDs are unhappy because they're paying more taxes. People in Sackville are getting, you know, paying higher taxes, getting fewer services because we have to spread ourselves more thinly. It doesn't matter. He'll be able to, he got it done and the blame will be on the new municipality. It's sleazy, but we're window dressing. And if you give them cover, you're aiding and abetting. Yeah, and it's... Uh... You know, it, it, it's difficult to think about what the future of all of this is going to look like because we don't know and we haven't been told what the future is going to is going to look like. It's all very ethereal, you know, um, you know, uh, fi taxes and, and financing that's going to happen later. Well, what does that look like? Well, you know, we'll get to it and and we'll we'll figure it out. You know, roads or roads and LSDs are going to be maintained by the provincial government. Okay, well, what does that mean for level of service? Well, we'll 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 figure it out. We'll figure it out. So, um, yeah, the the initial road work that needs to get done on municipal reform is just to push it through and and like you said, get her done. But it's it's tough to make uh, opinions on what things, how it's going to happen, and what it's going to look like, either positively or negatively. In the future because we really don't know any information and that's the, that's part of the problem um just really quickly the from uh mr peters's report uh just the definitions of the roles and responsibilities the transition facilitator achieve milestones identified by the minister the advisory committees attend meetings provide advice and assist with research um, municipal council and LSD committees keep doing daily work, business as usual. Okay, so you know that that seems fairly lighthearted because business as usual will be difficult because there's extra business, right? To to do. Um, but I, I do. I mean, I, I'm on the advisory committee. We haven't sat yet. I, I don't know what to expect. But going in, uh, knowing that it's it's merely advice uh, and, and not full-on consultation and collaboration, I'm a little wary. I'm cautiously optimistic that Chad will make a, the right decision and listen to the people who are talking to him. Um, but I guess that's just, we just have to wait and see what happens. But uh, anyway, um, so really quickly, Sabine, if you don't mind, the yeah. last point I had in yeah. this just, um, just for but Andrew, just just because of sure. your you're finishing with the you just read this about the advisory committee uh, about the yes about the advisory committee that little itty bitty point where it says that proceedings are not the councils are not privy to the proceedings of the advisory committee. That's just right. I wanted to add that. So thank you. Yeah, you know, the, and, and good point. You're right. So the advisory committee will be um, it is going to be closed doors. Um, and then the advisory committee can uh, inform council about some stuff, I guess, that's talked about in the advisory committee. That 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 as well is really unknown. So, what information can be covered in the in the advisory committee with council? I don't know. You know, are, are we going to be uh, silenced? I, I'm not. I'm not sure. I, I really don't know what what this is, but. 
Chad said that the advisory committee would report back to council uh, with ish things that were discussed. Um, so we'll just have to wait and see how that plays out. Um, and there was also, it was, it was kind of a two-way street, as I remember, that that council would would have an opportunity to ad advise the people who were on the advisory committee. Our issue was that the timeline was too tight for us to be able, for council to be able to advise the uh, advisory committee members. Um, but anyway, we'll, we'll see how that plays out. Um, the last thing I was going to say is that there was a brief exchange about communication. And after some back and forth, Mr. Peters made it clear that communication to the residents of Sackville would be up to council and staff to deliver. Um, now, that's what I remember him, him saying. We kind of went back and forth on this. What information can we give? Um, when can we give it? And I, I think Chad initially was a little, sorry, Mr. Peters, I should call him, was a little um, unclear on that. But at the end of it, he felt it best to leave the communications of uh, Sackville News to the channels that we currently operate by. Um, so, I mean, here we are in our municipal reform committee of council telling people what we have learned about municipal reform at this point. And town staff have now created the uh, local governance reform web page on the town of Sackville with updated information that they can give. Um, I mean, there's going to be stuff that they're not privy to, obviously, but um, anyway, so we do have some communication channels open and hopefully we can continue that as much as possible. Um, Anyway, that, that's all I had for the meeting with Chad Peters and information that we've heard up to this point. Um, more recently, we got an email pushing those time limits for composition of council, name of the municipality, or sorry, name of the entity, um, and I'm missing something else. Oh, and if there was a, sorry, Bill, go ahead. The nature of the entity, whether oh, right. it's a town or a, yeah. right. Right, so we, yeah. we, we've we had a, an email pushing those dates fairly hard from, you know, down the workflow, right, from the minister to the deputy minister, da, 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 to the facilitator to us. Um, so that's, anyway, that's just a piece of news that, that those dates are pretty tight. So February 11th is what Sabine had said. That was what was in the uh, um, paper that we received from the deputy minister and the transition team lead. Um, so that's... That's all I had with our, our current situation. So if there's any anything that anybody wants to say about uh, where we are or talk about the reform process up to this point, uh, council or staff, um, go ahead, Sabine. Um, just on the communications piece, I think um, uh, this is, it's still a bit vague, but we can expect that only we will only hear those communications that are allowed to go out, both from the advisory committee as well as from administration. So I do not expect um, really that there will be much uh, coming out unless, you know, it's okay, so the decision has been made to do ABC or this is what it will look like and this is what will happen. So it, it's just, it, it will it will look, it, my, my feeling is, and I'm pretty sure this is the case because otherwise you, would, you wouldn't set up a process like this with that kind of time frame. It is going to be um, um, a fait accompli once we hear it, and that's what we communicate out. And so, and this is this is this is where where I think um, you know I I really did not want to own this as a process, and that's why. So we were thrown, we were told, well, if you want to engage with your community, go ahead. Um, it's not up to us to engage around a process that's owned entirely by the province. That's my feeling. Um, and since the province will be responsible for what gets communicated out, um, it's sort of, um, again, to me, a whitewashing. And yet we do, you know, we need to communicate outwards as a community, um, as council and as, um, as, as the town. We need to communicate out. And it will be an excruciating process for trying to get um, the information out in a timely manner before things are finalized. Um, I suspect it will be impossible to do that. Um, nevertheless, I'm glad we do have the town site and the stuff is coming out timely. The things that can be published, which is really great. At least that. At least that. Yes. So. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Bill? 
Yeah, I want to echo that is that we this is not our deliberations that we're, we've decided that we need to keep confidential. Anything that I know about this process, I'm going to share with the constituents We're this is not our process. We're not deciding about, you know, what what meets the criteria under the act for in camera. We are in the dark, too, and we're we don't own this. And I'm going to make that clear. You know, it, it, historically, every time an occupying force took over um, a country or an area, they would always try to get the local people to enforce the rules, right? So that they would own them and it would seem like there was a democratic government. But if you're in a position like Putin's Russia is ostensibly democratic, but don't try to be in opposition there. Um, this is this is standard practice. And I think it's really important where the, the risk to ourselves of doing the right thing and, and being part of the resistance rather than being a collaborator. I think it's incumbent on us to be part of the resistance because it's so easy. Nobody's threatening to kill us. The consequences of not towing the line and justifying or uh, what would you call it, being complicit in what is undemocratic, unfair, dishonest, whatever you want to call it, I think is really important. If this is forced on us, it's forced on us, but it's not going to be our doing. And we're not, I mean, speaking for myself, I am not going to welcome it or be complicit in it. Um, thanks, Bill. Um, did anybody, anyone else want to say anything? I, I, I've got a couple of points that I, that I wanted to raise, just personally, my feelings on the reform process going forward. But if anybody wanted to speak, I, I've done a lot of talking. Uh, and my voice is getting raspier as I go, but um, if anyone else wants to have anything to say, Mike, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Andrew. I'm, I'm curious, have you been told that when you have your advisory committee meetings, you will not pass on information uh, or certain information to council or what you receive can be shared with council after your meeting? I, I ha we haven't been told anything, Mike. Um, I, I was trying to remember back to the, the meeting with uh, Mr. Peters when we talked initially about the advisory committee and exchange of information. And, you know, it sort of went back and forth and, and I, I, didn't, I didn't get a firm idea about what the exchange would be. Um, it sounded like to me, as I said, that council could give some not direction, I guess, but council could give some uh, opinions to the people who would represent them on the advisory committee on certain topics. What those topics are would change as as the the committee met. Um, and I was under and I was under the impression that the advisory committee members would then be able to report back to council. Now I may have that wrong. Um, we haven't had our first meeting yet. There hasn't been any direction yet. All we have is a meeting date. Right. And I remember from that meeting with Mr. Peters, because I was pushing him, well, I think three or four times, because he was avoiding the communication aspects. Right. And as uh, Bill had said to him that, you know, this is not ours. So you have the responsibility, uh, Mr. Peters, or government to inform the people. We're not going to tow your line and give your feedback that but he also it's in my mind I hear him saying that well what happens in this meeting or your meetings is uh, information that will come back to council letting us know what was talked about in there because we're not privy to be in there and we can share that information with the public and and which should be automatically because there's no in-camera session going on uh, so there should be any holdbacks on it. But he also, and I think it's also because of some pushing from Bill on, it's your responsibility, Mr. Peters, uh, that they have to, when it comes up to dealing with this and approaching the people, they have to give that presentation because I have no taste in my mouth at all to giving any of you know, that they tell us we have to do. It's like getting on a bus. And so you're going, you're hoping to get off of Moncton. And they say, oh, no, you can't get off here. We're going to Halifax. What are you talking about? You know, we, well, how about stop? No, we can't stop until we're done. So it's, it's, it's ridiculous. And 
So I just want to, I'm glad you agree with my thought patterns in Italy. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. Bill? Uh, uh, just a, yeah, just a I quick, can I just, uh, because I've got the email open from, that actually talks about the openness of the advisory committee. So the advisory committee is to report back to their respective council and LSD to solicit feedback to be shared with the advisory committee. The proceedings of the advisory committee, which means what they're talking about actually, will not be open to the public or to other members of council. Just to... That's sure. Correct. The point yeah, I want to raise... That meeting. I understand yeah, that. The point I want to... Andrew... Uh, Mr. Peters is not Andrew's boss. If he invites Andrew and Sean to a meeting and says stuff and says, I don't want you to tell this, they don't have to say yes. If you don't tell me, whatever you tell me, I'm going to tell the members of council and the public. And if you don't like that, then don't tell me. He's not their boss. This, this is being imposed on us. And I think it's really important. I want everyone to know as much as possible of what's going on. This is not the deliberations of council in camera for legitimate reasons. This is the government doing something, which I'm sure I understand why they don't want people to know what they're doing, because it's undemocratic. But, you know, Andrew, I hope, will participate in the meeting. And if he's told, don't tell people this, he say, too bad, I'm going to. What's he going to do? Right? Andrew has a job to do, so does Sean. And it's to be, you know, represent the town's interest on this, this and do whatever they can. I mean, it's little enough as it is. If they try to further emasculate it, I think it's completely inappropriate. But we can say no. He's not the boss. He can force stuff on us, but he's not our boss. Yep, I agree with you. Uh, and I, I mean, I, I guess we'll find out more information when we get into the advisory committee meeting, because like, like I said, aside from the email that Sabine read, um, we, we don't really know yeah. much. We don't, we don't know what, what's going to, what's going to happen with the advisory committee. Um, and he doesn't so, either. <laughs> so you know? we, we have, it's 657. I'm not sure if this, if this meeting will stop right at seven o'clock. Um, but I, I just wanted to say really quickly, I'm, I had some a couple other points, just personal points on the reform process going forward, but I'm not going to read all of the stuff that I had. But I guess I'll just summarize in saying the reform process up to this point, during the reform process up to this point, and including the last month, I think it's pretty clear that, um, and we've said it tonight, that the government is going to do this the way they want to do it. Um, Bill 82 was passed the way that it was and had the um, the ability for the minister and his department to do what they want. Um, council doesn't really have a lot of clout when it comes to the overall reform process. I think that that's pretty clear. Um, so I guess knowing that, I think it is important like I said in my initial thoughts on the on the reform history piece, to continue to be vocal about what it is that we have problems with. Now, whether that will actually mean that changes will happen, because I, I get the feeling, based on history, that there is a, a certain way that the government and the minister's department want the reform process to go, and they don't want to veer from that. Right, the letter for our the of the suggestion for us to change our boundaries was denied um, because it would change things, and they don't want that to change. So um, I think it's pretty pretty important to work through the process because that's what we have to do, but also to make sure that we are vocal and uh, about the concerns of of Sackville and the and the people that elected us. Um, making sure that we push the for the things that are problematic that we see as problematic. Um, talk to staff, you know, make sure that 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 staff, uh, if they have any concerns, that you know they're voicing those as well, which I'm sure that they will as much as they can. Um, and and work through the process. It's unfortunate it uh, that it that it's come out this way that the reform process has has. Uh, has got to this point, um, but the, as Bill said at the beginning, the minister and his department want this to happen. Um, reform is needed at some point. 
in this province. And, and if this is the way it's going to, that it's going to happen, then we need to be uh, as vocal as possible and to be uh, involved. So anyway, that, that's my, my closing points. Um, we might have a couple of minutes if anybody wanted to say something really quickly. Sabine. Yeah, I think I think the oh. next steps are the ones that I want to do that I wanted to touch on. One is, um, you know, us moving forward with the terms of reference because we need to, you know, that would need to be council approved. Sure. Um, also identifying where we can advise and how we can advise. Like, you know, what do we do between now and February the 11th? Um, how how do we get the pulse of the community if we want to? Um, uh, do we even want to? Because we know that the end result will be the same. doesn't really matter. And then um, if we as a, as a council want to do any community engagement at all for whatever purpose, the only one that I can see right now is literally the name. Um, because obviously government's not doing it. So I think these are these are things that I think we should touch on so we get an idea on, on what council weeks, two and a half weeks or so. Um, so those are sort of pieces that I'd like to get a sense on. I'd like to get a sense on is this, is, are we going to continue with this committee? Which to me is a, you know, currently it's a, it's sort of set up as a weekly one. That was the initial intent. Uh, we're not going to have weekly updates on this. I have, I can't imagine that we'll have enough to update, but you know, what's, is it useful to maintain this as a venue for exchange and at least for having a more free discussion than in an official council meeting? Uh, that, so that may be something we should we should also touch on, Andrew. Yeah, I, I think that the term you're right, the terms of reference, I think that we should look at that um, it, you know, it, as soon as possible. We have our uh, special council meeting on Monday, regular council meeting the week after. So if we can look at this and hash it out, um, figure out what what it is, even even if it I guess bring the draft forward again, take a look at it, see if it needs to be changed and bring it forward just so that we can have some kind of discussion on it. I think that that's probably key. Mm -hmm. um, but I guess that's dependent on whether, to your point, whether we want to keep this committee going. Um, I, I, I think you're right that I don't know if we need a weekly meeting, but I think that this one we pulled together. We talked about it last week, I think it was, and we and we pulled this together with the help of staff. So I think maybe we could have this. Uh, we don't need 48 hour advance notice for a committee of council meeting. So if we can uh, if we can do this as we as needed, um, maybe that would be the way to go. I don't know how to write that into the terms of reference though, but that's something. That yeah, I can I can draft something, Andrew, where where we can say you know if if there is a need felt by um, you know four councillors to have a meeting, then it can be called um, something that's that's acceptable to everybody. I can redraft and circulate with whatever we're talking about now. And as for engaging. Uh, engaging Sackville residents about um, council, like council composition or name. Um, I'm not exactly sure how to do that. I mean, Sean and I have our advisory meeting on Tuesday um, at six o'clock at night. Uh, so we need something that's gonna be fairly quick and, and, and out there. I don't know if we could, we could do a poll and, and put it on like some kind of a poll or survey or something and put it on Sackville's uh, community channels, um, the town of Sackville page, social media. I, I really don't know how to how to do this so but, quickly. But this on, is and on the exact, fly. But I think this is the problem, right, Andrew? I I remember when it first came up. You know, this is a complicated thing. How do we want to go forward? Um, is it is it at large in Sackville and uh, uh, you know award system outside? So it's a really complicated thing. You so you're doing a poll and people will you know rightfully ask, what are you talking about? Right. So it's it it would be nice to know well what exactly do we want to do something and then if yes then can we pull in some other folks to help us actually talk about it and get some response and that's still what Tuesday that's we have Tuesday. about yeah. yeah so that's so we, a really that, excellent good timeline yeah I know I know it's it, it's uh, it's crazy yeah but it, but I I would say you know if anybody can help us with that I mean I don't know. It, that's more like a, a, you know, a media help or nonprofit help. A, that it's like we could do a quick uh, YouTube video on the explanation of what it means to have a ward system and an at-large system, and then attach that to some kind of a survey <laughs> document that's uh, 
submitted through communication channels? I don't know. I mean, you're right. It, it, people would probably not know exactly what we're talking about. Um, some people would, of course. But uh, yeah, I, I, I don't know what step to take to, to do that. But it would be nice to have some input. With the speed of this, I get the feeling that there's already a decision made. Um, but uh, I guess we'll see again. You know, I hate I hate to say it. We'll see at the advisory meeting. It makes it sound like, you know, we'll wait for the transition team. Um, anyway, now, uh, sorry, Bruce had, had his hand up before Sabine, and I, I bypassed you. I apologize, Bruce. And then uh, Ken, I think, had his hand up uh, next. So if you guys want to go ahead. Okay. Uh, I was just going to say, as a matter of fact, to reiterate what's already, Bill's already said, we were lied to, as a matter of fact, that we were told there would be no forced amalgamation. And the other thing that was said tonight, as a matter of fact, by yourself and others, was the fact that this is going ahead, whether we like it or not. We don't have any say. Uh, I'd like to bring to the attention to the people, too, uh, who's mentioned Bill 82. If you read between 104 and 106, it actually states that the minister has the right to do whatever he wants. And that's there. So that will, I just want to put that out there so the people don't have to go through the whole thing to see exactly where that says. Um, it's said that actually it's happening in this format, as a matter of fact. I, I, but I'd also like to say to the people out there, any of you people who actually have some connections or whatever, and there's something that you find out that we, that you think that we would be able to put forward, please tell us, as a matter of fact, because we don't know the answers to, to what's going on, and we don't know what's going to happen. The other thing is, is this advisory committee that's made up of the elected officials and everything, to me, it's like an in-camera meeting because we're only going to be allowed to be told so much. And that's even coming from our elected officials because, I mean, it's been said, as Sabine said, that we, you will only be allowed to tell us what they tell you that we are allowed to know. And we are elected officials ourselves. So what does that tell you about what, what kind of process is happening at the present time? Um, I just please, everybody out there, just turn around and keep, please take an interest in this because this is serious. And we really don't know exactly how how badly it's going to impact us, and because it is going to happen, and we've got to turn around and try and find a way to minimize the impacts as best we can. As a matter of fact, so anyway, thank you very much. Thanks, Bruce. I I, I think the the sections of Bill 82 that you're talking about, um, they're they're in there so that the minister can be able to deal with anything that happens with the reform process, especially in places that don't currently have councils and representation and staff, right? It makes it a little easier to be able to do that kind of work if you have absolute oversight. Uh, and, but when it comes to a community like Sackville or Dorchester or others in the province that have a council, um, have bylaws, have structure, have staff, um, it, it does look, out to me a little bit like overreach. Um, so hopefully the process rolls out in a, a friendly manner so that uh, there isn't an opportunity for the minister to just say, well, I'm just gonna do it anyway. So, because I mean, to your point, Bruce, that, that could happen. I'm not saying it's going to, but it could happen. Um, Ken, go ahead. Yeah, Andrew, I just wanted to add the part when we were talking about terms of reference um, for, me, for communication with the public and whatnot. I think um, it's there's probably some, there's actually some value in in adding a piece in our terms of reference to uh, to receive some feedback from the community for uh, the naming of the municipality coming up. Uh, I know the timelines are, are, are um, tight. Um, uh, same with our uh, council composition. Timeline's really tight, so I don't know if we try to have another meeting in a couple days time um you know maybe we could all do our own little bit of research to see what might suit best uh for sackville and then kind of have a brief discussion and then invite uh, some community uh uh involvement on on what we can do there but i think if we add that piece into our terms of reference um that'll be a good thing going forward for future meetings for whatever down the road uh, may bring Thanks, Ken. Allison? Sorry, one would think I would have been ready for that, right? Um, I'm an optimist. 
I'm big on communication and I think it's really important that we keep communicating with the public. And I really, really believe in community consultation. And I also really, really believe that it doesn't matter how much consultation we do, whether it's at a council level or at a community level, because I think that this is going to happen the way that the province wants it to happen. So whenever we're able to engage the community, I think that we have to be really, really clear with them and let them know how completely our hands are tied. And I truly believe that most of this consultation that they're suggesting we should do is one, so that we own it rather than them when we don't, and two, so that when people think they have a consensus and it's going to be the way it will be, and then it isn't, we will be the ones who will be responsible for it rather than i really feel the facilitator should be looking after all of this consultation not because i don't think it's important but because of people as people have said tonight we don't own this even though we would like to own it and look after it and try to guide it and put it where it needs to be in order for the best interests of sackville and the other communities surrounding us we don't own it so if we're going to do any community consultation, I think the number one thing we say has to be that, you know, guys, here we are. We'd love to consult. We're not sure it makes a difference. And and I hate being this negative. I hate that I'm there. Thanks. Uh, Bill and maybe something quick from Sabine. We should probably wrap this up, guys. It's uh, 12 minutes yeah. off now. I want to follow up on the, all this talk about the public. We have some members of the public on this call who haven't been able to participate other than Wayne Findell, who is impossible to control. Um, I think that um, I, I want to meet weekly would be fine. More, more frequently it would be better until there are no members of the public on this call. Do you know what I mean? Is that they haven't had a chance to participate and that was part of it when we had this in mind. It would we would say what we know and they would hear from members of the public. We might get ideas, we might just get people complaining, but it could be an, a, a conversation. This is the first public meeting and it's great. Thank you for doing this, Andrew. I thought you did a reasonably good job and that's high praise. <laughs> but I, I want I want the public to participate. So I, I would like to meet again as soon as possible. But to Allison and Ken's point, yes, it would be nice to get public input, but no way we're going to own this because we know how this government consults. They consulted for a year, misrepresenting the whole thing. So the discussion wasn't about what was going to happen. So no, I don't want to touch that. But letting uh, members of the public speak to their representatives, we still do have some authority. Uh, would be a good thing. So I would like to see that in subsequent meetings, more public participation. And if we if we had had more time, considering this was the first meeting, and I will apologize. I mean, we, we're already going over uh, the time limit. Um, you know, staff are involved in this call as well. Um, you know, they work their full days, and now they're you know on this call in the evening. So. You know, I, I it would be nice to have people be able to ask questions, honestly. And you're right, Bill, I think that that's a, a, a key piece. But now that we've sort of laid some groundwork, done the, the history, that like this kind of stuff wouldn't have to happen each meeting. There'd be a greater opportunity for people to be able to get be involved in the conversation and talk about things, ask questions, concerns. Maybe we won't have the answers, maybe we will. But uh, I, I think that that, I think you're right, it would be nice to be able to have that, uh, that piece. Um, Sabine and oh, Mike has his hand up too. Sabine, go ahead quick. Okay, so maybe I'll just follow up um, what, what Bill said and what Ken said as well, that our next step is really to have to have another meeting and basically whoever wants to talk about the award or at large system to get that out. And then instead of um, asking council to send in a, an, an, a recommendation, let that be the conversation that we that Andrew can take to the to the to the advisory committee since we we have no influence on that anyway. Um, but I think it would be fair because I you know I I as as councillor if it would come to council on Monday to make a decision on which system to bring forward to the advisory council I would vote against it out of principle I I would abstain or vote against it, whichever one it is automatically just because of that that total lack of input from anybody else so maybe. 
what we can do, at least that we can do. So, Andrew, you can actually say this is what you heard, because currently you have only heard some of us. And that mm -hmm. would give people people that are actually, you know, that want to participate in the conversation from the public an opportunity just to throw this at you. Like there's a couple examples that that came in on the chat there that I somehow I only see fly by. But I think it would be really um, and this is a tight timeline. I I don't I don't need any more meetings in the evening. Staff certainly I'm, I know don't. But I think this is the one. This is the one that's really immediate. And the next one is for the naming, right? So you know the th those are the two pieces that really there is any chance that that can be said. So maybe maybe that needs to happen uh, as a next step. Um, yeah, we can. I, I I'm not sure if we can pick a date tonight but i think that we could considering how quickly we got this uh, meeting together i think we can do something over the next couple of days and and get people together that's not a bad point um just so everybody knows the note that was in chat um somebody had suggested to start with a pros versus cons list of wards and at large um you know that that would be reasonably easy to put together and and put out and uh, you know put it out to even just social media, for example, or the town's, town's uh, channels. It's better than doing nothing. Um, and maybe we'll get some traction from it. Uh, at the very least, explain what those are and see if people comment or have any, any, uh, anything to say about it. So that, that's what was, was posted in, uh, in chat, just so everybody knows. Um, Mike? Okay, and I'll keep this as short as possible. Sure. Um, um, I, I agree we should have a, a, at least one meeting a week and more often if really needed. Uh, number two, when it comes to the power of the minister, I think that that minister was given power to control communities like ours who uh, believe in democracy and can put up a good argument why we should or should not do certain things. And three, I think... Uh, you, we mentioned social media. Uh, we have, uh, Sharon Hicks has uh, uh, a page. Um, uh, Marlene from Dorchester has one. Josh has his. Uh, we have Bruce Warwick and we have Erica who can all have messages out there to get people involved and pass this information on. So I think we should take full advantage of those also. Thank you. Yeah, we, it would be good to get some idea, some sense from the public, um, what they would like, at the very least, the composition of council. I think that that would be, you know, what's the preference, um, ward system or at large representation. Yeah. Um, I think that would, would be think, good to, to do, for sure. I would think it'd be uh, hybrid, uh, knowing how. Yeah, the, the, most recent memo, the, most recent memo, the most recent memo says, uh, identify and finalize boundaries by February 4th. And the second. <laughs> Wow. Uh, and then determine the uh, wards are at large by, yeah, like we said, February 11th. So we have our advisory meeting on Tuesday. Um, I wish I had my calendar up. But anyway, so we, well, we've only got there, nine days before that happens. So yeah. there, there is a map out there right now of Entity 40 as it's uh, proposed, is there not? Yes, there is. Yeah. Yes, there is. Now, we have the, a link the, on our the, what they said about that really quickly before we go is the 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 main boundary has already been decided and then there was a new map that came out um which i guess uh finalized those boundaries not finalized them but they're they're more solid than they were the previous um boundary lines mm -hmm. by the government but what they're looking for is if there was any minor details that may have been missed so uh you know the boundary line may cut through somebody's yard and half of their yard could be an entity 40 and half of it could be an entity, you know, whatever, 39, or it could be in Bulbasay uh, Est for what, you know, th those little finer details. It has happened in the past that has caused legal problems within the province when there's been amalgamation or boundary changes. So I think that they're trying to avoid that and they're, and they're putting that um, on the transition team. Again, that, I don't know that, that that's, sort of what I, what i've heard so um but by the fourth so we have two days to accomplish that yeah um anyway so i guess i guess that's it for tonight guys we're at a an hour and 25 minutes into this it was supposed to be an hour 
Um, my apologies to staff, but thank you for staying on with us and thank you for recording it. Um, thanks for everybody who attended as well. I apologize that people weren't able to, uh, to ask questions or be involved in the conversation. But as we said here tonight, if we have another meeting um, soon, that, uh, that we can have some um, uh, public engagement within this committee. Excellent. All right. Well, thanks, everyone. Uh, have fun sleeping on all the information. Thanks, Andrew. <laughs> thanks, Andrew. Good night, everyone. Good night, guys. Good, Good night. night. Thanks, Andrew. Thanks, folks. Good night, Mr. Findell. Thank you. I miss the old days already.